Okay, so let's start. Good morning. Uh, today, uh, we the lecture is about primary composition. It's a very classical and important topic in commutative algebra. And uh, we start with uh, motivation. If we have a integer, an integer greater than one, let's say, then one of the first theorems we learn at school is that it has a unique decomposition in terms of powers of prime numbers. And uh, during uh, these lectures, we saw that one of the first theorems concerned uh, algebraic varieties. And what we proved is that the variety associated to an ideal has a unique decomposition as a union of irreducible varieties. And we remember that an irreducible algebraic variety corresponds to the fact that PI is a prime ideal. This is unique in the sense that we require that uh, the irreducible components they don't contain. One component does not contain the, the other components. Hence the aim of the today's lecture is to find a one statement that will generalize these two seemingly very different facts. And the notion that we will be very much using is exactly that of an ideal. So how can we phrase these uh, theorems in terms of ideals? Well, we have to remember to state fact one in terms of ideals that the integers, they form a ring. And in this ring, what are the prime ideals? Does anyone know what are prime ideals in the integer ring? So, yes? And the idea generated by the prime and zero. Yes, exactly. So that's, that's something you can check during a break, that the uh, ideals that are prime, and hence the name of prime ideals, these are those that are generated by prime numbers and there is additionally a zero. And what are other ideals? What are all ideals in the integer ring? How can you characterize ideals in the ring of integers? Yes? Basically an integer up to the sign. So. Yes, so, so, so this is important that the ideals in the ring of integers, they have just one generator. So you just pick a number and you can identify it with, uh, with, uh, uh, with a number. So we can state the first statement that if we have an ideal of uh, integers divisible by n, this is an intersection of powers of prime ideals. Maybe I should say what I mean by a power of an ideal. If I have an ideal here, we have just one generator, so you can guess that this is the same as P1 to alpha 1, the ideal generated by, uh, by this number. In general, if we have more generators, then the kth power of an ideal is uh, the ideal not only generated by the powers of the generator, but by all products. So I will maybe just define the square. So this will be F1 square Fs square, but also F1, F2, and so on. Fs minus 1 Fs. Okay, so we can see that this basic theorem in number theory can be restated as the theorem of uh, about intersections of ideals. And 
if we remember, so that's, that's point one, and to restate point two, let's say we work over an algebraically closed field, and over an algebraically closed field, the varieties, they are represented as radical ideals. So we can take a radical of the ideal I, and the fact that this is a union of uh, the varieties associated to prime ideals means that this is an intersection of prime ideals. Yes, the theorem that we really proved is that the radical of an ideal is an intersection of prime ideals, and it's a finite one. Any questions about this? Yes? Is there any generic way to represent an, an ideal generated by, I don't know, a finite number of elements? I mean, I know that if you're talking about polynomials, then we can just say, okay, um, polynomial time for a, a combination somehow of all the, of all the elements times polynomials. Is something similar also possible for general rings? If, if you have an ideal generated by S elements, then it, any element here is just a combination of gi, fi, from i equal 1 to s, where gi's are in your ring. Okay, so, so. so it doesn't matter whether fi's are polynomials or not. They are any elements of the ring. I mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm hinting or heading for is that now you can see that these two statements, one geometric, one number theoretic, they have the same flavor. They tell us that an ideal can be presented as an intersection of better behaved ideals. And this is something that, that we want to prove in general. And we will have a guiding set of questions. There will be three questions that we have to answer. So, I hope that right now we agreed that maybe a general statement we can hope for is that we can represent an ideal as an intersection of better behaved ideals. And the questions that we still have to answer are as follows. Like, what does it mean, better behaved? So, what kind of ideals should be allowed in the intersection? we should ask ourselves which, with what kind of rings we want to work. Clearly, we want a class that contains the integers and the polynomials, but, uh, but uh, but what rings we should care for? What rings are, should we consider? And the third one, uh, we see that not only the existence of such decompositions is important, it's also their uniqueness. And the question is, can we assume, or at least to which extent, can the decomposition be unique? Okay, so these are the three questions that will guide us towards obtaining nice algebraic theorems that we hope will generalize these two fundamental facts. So first we address one. What do you hope for? What can we say that, that any ideal in a ring R is an intersection of certain ideals, and what do you think? What kind of ideals? Let's move like 100 years back in algebra, and let's say we want to not only prove a theorem, but find a theorem. So what, what would be a very nice class of ideals we could hope for? Prime ideals. Prime ideals. That's maybe a natural guess, at least when we look at point two. But 
already when we look at integers, we see that it's not true that every integer is a product of primes. So primes is a very nice class of ideals, but we cannot hope that every ideal is an intersection of prime ideals. And in fact, these are radical ideals that can be characterized like that, and this is one of the exercises for you. So we need a larger class than prime ideals. What could be a next guess? So look at point one, and what can you say that? And, well, it's not an intersection of prime ideals, but it's an intersection of what? Primary ideals. Primary, that's already a good guess. But, well, if you lived 100 years ago, probably this is not a guess that you would have made because, <laughs> because uh, you wouldn't have an intuition that you need primary ideals. Uh, it's only because nowadays we know they play an important role. Usually what, what I think would be a natural guess would be powers of prime ideals. This is a natural generalization of, of the number theoretic statement. But this is not true that that the powers of prime ideals is the correct class. And in fact, this is an example that I have written in the notes that if we take x square y as an ideal in C of x, y, this is not an intersection of powers of prime ideals. Why? Because there is only one prime ideal that contains it. It's x, y. There is no other prime ideal that contains it. And this is not a power of that ideal. OK, so this is, in fact, the statement we hope for. And uh, let, me, let me tell you that over the integers, why one can be confused, is that primary ideals over the integers, these are exactly ideals generated by powers of primes. So that is why over the integers, we cannot distinguish. But in general, it's not true that the primary ideals and powers of primes coincide. OK. Any questions about this? OK, everything is clear. Now, the second question, what uh, rings are should should be considered. This is uh, a, a very important question that, again, now when we know commutative algebra is very easy, so there is a very large class of rings that basically any ring you encounter naturally has this property, and this is Netherian. Let me first recall what does it mean for a ring to be Netherian. There are a few equivalent conditions that we will use. One condition, so the following are equivalent. Every ascending chain of ideals stabilizes. Yeah. That's one. And the second one is that every ideal is finitely generated. OK. And this is easy to prove that these two are equivalent. And in fact, what we are proving today, the primary decomposition, is one of the reasons why Netherian ideals are also so important. And Amy Netter, a famous uh, mathematician, she was studying primary decomposition, and Netherian rings are named after her. Sorry, do you claim that that idea we wrote is not contained in any prime? It is contained in a unique prime, x, y. But it's not the power of it. So if it was an intersection of powers of primes, it has to be an intersection of powers of primes that contain it. But there is only one that contain it, so it would have to be equal to the power of x, y. But you can check that it's not. It's not the second power. It's not the first power. OK. OK. So. Now, before we go to question three, just under these two assumptions, we can start proving theorems. Namely, we will prove that in a Netherian ring, every ideal is a finite intersection of primary ideals. 
Okay, that's, that's the theorem we, we want to prove, and we will prove it right away. Before we do that, we just need one more definition. It's a technical one. It's, it's much less important than what's a prime ideal or what's a primary ideal or what's an ethereal, but still it's useful in, uh, in, in, uh, in the theorem that we will be proving. So we will say that the ideal i is irreducible If the following equivalence holds, if implication, if it is an intersection of two ideals, then i is equal to j1 or i is equal to j2. Yes, so in other words, an ideal is irreducible if we cannot present it properly as an, as an intersection of two ideals. Okay, so now we, we prove a theorem. R will be a Netherian ring. And the claim is that every ideal has a finite presentation of prime by prime as an intersection of primary ideals. There is one important question that I haven't asked you because you suggested to look at primary ideals yourself. Do you remember what's a primary ideal? Maybe I will recall it to be on a safe side. So it's a little bit weaker than prime. So for prime, you remember that if a product is in the ideal, then one of the factors belongs to the ideal. That's the definition of a prime ideal. Well, here we require a little less. So if we have A not in the ideal, then we do not conclude that B is in an ideal, but e, B is in the radical of Q. So in other words, B to some power belongs to Q. Okay. So it's, it's a larger class. We will, we will see it in, in a moment. Let's prove it. So the proof has two steps. In step one, we prove that in a Netherian ring, every ideal is a finite intersection of irreducible ideals. Yes? So we want to present i as intersection of ji's. This is a finite thing. And these are irreducible. That's step one. So not primary, but irreducible. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, let's assume this is not the case. So let's say we have an ideal that is not a finite intersection of irreducible ideals. Let's call it J1, not finite intersection. Well, if it is not a finite intersection of irreducible ideals, in particular, it is not an irreducible ideal. Yes? So it means that it is an intersection of some J2, J2 prime, where both of them are strictly bigger. Yes? Do you agree? Okay, now what about J2 and J2 prime? Could it be that both of them are finite intersections of irreducible ideals? So no, because then uh, J would also be an intersection. Uh, yeah, J1 would also be an intersection. Exactly. So if J2 was an intersection and if J2 prime was an intersection of finite number of irreducibles, we take all of those together. And we get an intersection of J2 and J prime, which is J1. So we can assume that J2 is also not a finite intersection of irreducible ideals. Yes? 
OK, but then we can play this game again. We can say that J2 is an intersection of J3 and J3 prime. And again, either J3 or, or J3 prime does not have a finite presentation as an intersection of irreducible ideals. And we build such a chain. And this is a contradiction with Netarianity. We have built an infinite ascending chain of ideals. OK? Yes? So the Ji's are not the same as the J, J1, 2, 3, or? No, no. So this is a claim that for every ideal i, i1. And here we assume this is not true. So assume not true. Not true. For some, for some, J1. Maybe if you, if you prefer to distinguish it, I can make everywhere here a new letter. Yeah? If this is not true for some J1 tilde, we find a bigger, strictly bigger ideal J2 tilde for which this statement also fails. And then we find a strictly bigger J3 tilde for which this statement also fails. And we can build an infinite chain of ideals for which this statement also fails, but this is not important. The important thing is that it's an infinite chain of strictly ascending ideals. Okay, and if you couldn't find such a larger ideal, then it would be already irreducible. Or it would be an intersection of two ideals that have a finite presentation as irreducible, uh, as intersection of irreducible ideals. Okay, but to find, and in the first place, J2 and J2 prime, you need uh, that they are not irreducible. Yes, but if J1 tilde was irreducible, then I'm done. It is a finite intersection of, it, it's, it's just an intersection of one irreducible ideal. Okay, so this is step one. And step two is to prove that in a Netherian ring, irreducible, re irreducible ideals are primary. Okay, so we have to take an irreducible ideal and prove that it is primary. So let's assume that Q is irreducible. And we want Q to be primary. Okay, if we prove it, we are done. Now, it's a little easier to work in a quotient ring. So what are the properties of the quotient ring? When in one of the exercises, you will prove that this is also a Netherian ring. If R is a Netherian, then also the quotient is Netherian. And if you look, for example, at an ascending chain property, that's basically obvious. Uh, so this is a Netherian ring. And what does it mean that Q is primary? What does it mean about this ring? Do you remember? That was, I think, in lecture one. What's the characterization of primary ideals if we divide by them? It tells something about zero divisors and nil potents. So let's translate this condition. AB in Q means that AB is zero in this ring. A not in Q means that A is non-zero in this ring. And B to the N in Q means that B to the N is zero. Yeah? So in other words, we want to say that this thing tells us that B is a zero divisor, and we want to conclude from it that B is nilpotent. OK? OK, so this is what we want. And we need to use Netherianity. So we need to build an ascending chain of ideals, and we want to use the fact that it stabilizes. So we will look at elements that have this property that if you multiply b by them, you get 0. So this is known as the annihilator of b. Uh, so this is, this is the set of x's such that xb is 0. OK, that's our first ideal. And we would also want to know what happens farther. So clearly, this is inside annihilator of b square. This is inside annihilator of b to the third, and so on. 
Because if we have x times b to the third, uh, sorry, if we have x b zero, then also x b to the third is zero. This is clear that this is a containment, but it cannot be always strict containment, yes? We must have that there exists an n such that the annihilator of bn is the same as annihilator of bn plus one. By the Noetherianity property, we have an ascending chain, so it must stabilize, okay? Okay, so now we claim we claim that the intersection of these two ideals is just zero. So before we prove the claim, let us see that this proves this statement. Okay. So how could it be that this is zero? Recall that Q was irreducible. So in other words, zero is irreducible in this ring. So what does claim imply? Assume for a moment the claim. I will prove it in a second. What does it imply under the assumption that Q is irreducible or equivalently under the assumption that zero is irreducible in, in this ring that we work in? Yes, one of those two ideals has to be zero because they are strictly larger. Well, they cannot be both strictly larger than zero. That would contradict the irreducibility. But we know that A is non-zero. So the only option is that this ideal is zero. But this means that B to the N is equal to zero. If it was non-zero, then this ideal would be strictly larger. Yes? So if we prove the claim, we are done. Okay? So let's prove it. Well, how to prove that an intersection of two ideals is zero? We have to take an element in the intersection. What, what does it mean to take an element in the intersection? Well, this element has to be of the form lambda times a, and it needs to be a form of the form mu times b to the n for some lambda mu in R modulo q. Yeah? And we want to show that this is zero, that this element is zero, okay? Okay, so let us multiply this equality by b. So we have lambda a b is equal mu times b to the n plus one. Yes, I just multiplied by b. But what is lambda a b? It's zero, because AB is zero, yes? Okay, so this means that mu is in the annihilator of BN plus one, by definition. But this means that mu is in the annihilator of B to the N, because they are equal. But this means that mu bn is zero. So this means that this element is zero. The element we started from that is in the intersection has to be zero. Yeah? So this, this is the proof of the claim. And the claim implies the theorem. Okay? So we have proved a really important theorem right now. In the Noetherian ring, every ideal is an finite intersection of primary ideals. Okay, any questions about the proof? Now, there is a lemma that I leave as an easy exercise that uh, if Q is primary, uh, 
then the radical of Q is the unique prime ideal the unique minimal minimal prime ideal containing it this is a really easy lemma so i leave it for you as an exercise to prove it and uh, well there are two things First is that the other implication does not hold, and there are explicit examples in the notes. So there is a difference between having a radical prime ideal and being primary. So it's really the property of being primary that we are interested in. And the other one is, is, uh, is a definition or a name. So in this case, we say that it is, if this is, if this is called P, we say, that Q is P primary. Okay? That's just a name. We know that for a primary ideal, the radical is prime, so it's some ideal P, and we say that Q is P primary. Okay, and now I need to erase something. And now we will be heading, before I erase, to the third question. So we already know that in an Ethereum ring, every ideal is an intersection of primary ideals. But we would like to ask, what can be said about such a decomposition? Is it unique, or at least to which extent we can say that it is unique? OK. So now. Our next aim is to somehow improve this decomposition of primary ideals. And this will be done by grouping them somehow together. And for this, we need, we need two easy observations that we will, we will in fact prove. So a lemma, if we have ideals that are P primary, then their intersection is also P primary. Yes, so again, these are two statements. The intersection is primary and the radical is equal to P, okay? So first we prove what's the radical of this intersection. This is what we want to prove first. And then we will prove that it is primary and this will be the end of the lemma. Okay, so let's prove the crane lane. We take something in the radical. Well, what does it mean that an element is in, in, in the radical? It means that for some power, a to the n is in the intersection. Yes? Well, that's the definition of the radical. This means that for some power, a n is in every qi. Now, one is trivial. If we, if we have a power that is in everything, then, then of course it is in everything. But note that for the other implication, we have to use the fact that there is a finite number of QIs. So if we have an integer that puts A to some power in every single one, we can somehow take the top integer over all QIs, and then it means that there is one N that puts it in the intersection. Okay. Well, but this means that A belongs to the radical of QI for every I. Huh? But this means 
that A belongs to P. Huh? And that's the end of the proof, of the claim. Because we just showed that an element belongs to the radical of an intersection, even only if it belongs to P. So it means that the radical of the intersection is P. Okay? So let's check if we are on the same page. What remains to be proved? To have a lemma? What do we have to prove? What's missing? The intersection is yes, we have to prove that the intersection is primary. So let's, let's do it. So let's assume that AB belongs to the intersection. Okay, and let's assume that A does not belong to the intersection. Okay, very good. So, so because A does not belong to the intersection, it, there has to exist an index I0 such that A does not belong to QI0. Yes? Well, that's, that's a definition of not belonging to the intersection. Huh? But AB belongs there, because AB belongs to every single one. Okay? But if AB belongs to a primary ideal, and A does not belong to this primary ideal, we know that, the rad that, that B belongs to the radical of QI0. Yeah, that's a definition of a primary ideal. But we know that this is P, which is the radical of the intersection by the claim. So we have proved that if a product belongs to the intersection and A does not belong, then B belongs to the radical. That's exactly meaning that the intersection is primary. Yes? Any questions about this proof? Okay, so what this lemma tells us about a primary decomposition. So let's start, now even we can forget that the ring is Netherian. We have an ideal that is a finite intersection of primary ideals. What should we do with this intersection? How can we make it nicer using this lemma? Yes? <laughs> you can combine all the P, P primary ideals in the intersection to one. Exactly, yes. So it, we look at the radicals of those ideals, where this could be distinct things, but it could happen that a few of QIs have the same have the same radical P. But then this lemma tells us, well, your intersection is far too long. You should combine those primary ideals with the same radical together, because their intersection will be uh, also a primary ideal. Yes? So this is a first part of a definition of a minimal primary decomposition. There is one more thing that we should do and we shouldn't forget about it. Well, of course, if I take here an intersection with something very big, like a maximal ideal that contains i, this will be still a valid equality. But this m could be not needed because it may already contain the intersection. So this is a motivation for the following definition of the minimal primary decomposition, that these two properties that were, that were just uh, stated um, hold. So a definition. By the way, please note that here we did not use Netherianity. So this works for any ring. We only use Netherianity for having, for existence of an intersection. Yeah, but it seems to be not true that any intersection of just primary ideals is again primary. No, because we proved that any ideal can be an intersection of primary ideals. So it even cannot be true that an intersection of primary ideals is primary, because we know that there exist ideals that are not primary. Yes? And not even finite. Finite is also not enough. 
Not even finite, because every single ideal in an Ethereum ring is a finite intersection of primary ideals. We just proved it, it's still on a board. Yes, it's the theorem, not even a lemma, but a theorem that we proved. Every ideal is a finite intersection of primary ideals. And not every ideal is primary. X times Y. Okay. So, so okay. So we know already the primary decomposition exists, and now we want to make it better. So a minimal, minimal primary decomposition of an ideal I is a presentation as an intersection, finite intersection, where well, for sure we want QIs to be primary. Okay, now what did we just say? That if we look at radicals of QIs, if they coincide, we should put those together. So radical of QIs are distinct far ways. Okay, so these are the important conditions, and there is also this extra condition that we shouldn't put more ideals that we need, and this means that if we take the intersection of QI for, uh, for I distinct than some I zero, then uh, this should be, uh, yes, so we don't, want, we don't want this to be included in QI zero. Don't want. Yeah? Because if this intersection is included in QI0, then it means that we don't need QI0 in the intersection. Yes, we could remove it and the total intersection remains the same. Okay. So, can you see that we have proved that in every Netherian ring, Every ideal has a minimal primary decomposition. We proved that it has a finite primary decomposition. We proved that we can combine the primary ideals so that the radicals are distinct. And it's obvious that we can remove the factors that don't play a role. So if we look at the ideal x square xy, you can see that these are in fact minimal primary decompositions. Yeah? These are primary ideals. The radicals in both cases are distinct, but, well, it's not the same one. Okay, so it seems that maybe, maybe this uniqueness just fails. But another theorem that I will not prove, I will just state, is that there is something that is unique and these are not the QIs, but the radicals. And so here, the ideals are distinct, but the radicals are the same, okay? So a theorem that for any ideal in a ring, the, the set of radical ideals rad qi does not depend on the minimal 
primary decomposition I equals intersection QI. Okay? And I will not prove it, but I will give you a hint of the proof is that this set of radicals QI, this is the same as the set of prime ideals of the form a radical of i divided by a. So do you know what's i divided by a? These are all elements in R such that x times a is in i. So such a quotient, a radical of such a quotient, it can be prime, it can be not prime, but I claim that this set of radicals, well, it's a finite set, and it's equal to the radicals of QIs when, where no matter which minimal primary decomposition we take, okay? And there is one more equality in the case of a Noetherian ring. It's the same thing here, but we forget the radical. prime ideals of the form i divided by a. And the complete proof can be found in the notes. It's not very complicated, but it's a little bit long, so I don't really have to uh, have time to, to go, go, get there. Okay, anyway, this theorem tells us that for every single ideal, there is a finite set of God-given prime ideals associated to it, yes? There is no set of God-given primary ideals, such that I is an intersection of them, but there is distinguished set of prime ideals associated to this ideal, yes? And you can take any single one of those three definitions if you are in a Noetherian ring. So clearly, this finite set of prime ideals deserves a name, yes? You can associate those prime ideals to your ideal, okay? So let's make a definition. A question? So are radical ideals always prime? No. So you have to take prime ideals of this form. Some of them will be, some, the ideals of this form could be prime or not. And if they happen to be prime, you put them in this set. But so what happens if you, if there's a radical in this set which can, which is not prime? And That's a very good question. What would happen if something here would be not prime? You would have found a contradiction in mathematics because the <laughs> radicals of primary ideas always are prime. Radicals of primary ideals, and there was a lemma, I think I already erased it. A radical of a primary ideal is a unique minimal prime ideal that contains it. So it's relevant that the QIs are primary, of course. Yes, yes, so it's important that they come from a minimal primary decomposition. Okay? So a definition, so we say, so, so, so the radicals, of QIs are called, are called the associated primes. Primes of the ideal I. And their set is denoted usually as the associated primes. Okay, so what are the associated primes of this ideal? Maybe someone who hasn't seen this before. 
of this ideal in the example? What are the associated primes? Can someone give me one associated prime? Maybe first the question, how many associated prime ideals will there, will there be? Okay, I mean, people are showing on their hands, but please speak. <laughs> Two, yes? And what this will be? Well, you don't have to first give me a, an answer in terms of generator. You can use the word radical. So what will be the associated primes? Yes? I mean, you take the radical of the egg, or, I mean, take one of those decompositions and then yes. the radical of the... First one and the second one? Yes, okay, that's very good. So the associated primes are the radical of this ideal and the radical of this ideal. What are those? Is it clear that those are both primary? Well, that's an exercise for you. I keep it as an exercise. Well, so if they were primary, we could, be, we could say that. Okay. Yes. So first, do we know that this one is primary? That's quite easy. Why? What's an argument that this is primary? We know that it's prime. It's even prime. Okay, so what's an associated prime? Someone else. What's an associated prime when we look at this primary ideal? What's a radical of this ideal? The ideal itself, yes? Okay, so that was the easy one. What's the radical of this ideal? Or if you prefer the radical of this ideal? X, Y. X, Y, yeah. So we have two associated primes, X and X, Y. Okay. Let's do some geometry now. We have a few minutes. So we did a lot of algebra. We have proved that in a Deuterian ring, associated uh, primes exist and every ideal has a minimal primary decomposition that maybe is not unique, but the radical of the primary ideals are unique. But we already know that ideals, they have something to do with varieties. Okay. Now, how can we see this ideal maybe a little geometrically? So first, let's look at x, y. What's the variety associated to x, y, if I want to draw it? What's the locus of points in C2 or R2? I will be drawing in R2 that vanish when, that, that is the vanishing locus of the ideal x, y. Yeah, 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 please, please speak loud. Sorry? Oh, the, two coordinate. the two coordinate axes, okay. That's easy. It's harder to say what's the vanishing locus of x square. Well, you can say that x square vanishes even only if x vanishes, yes? So you could say that it's this line. Yeah? But the ideal x squared is not really the ideal of x. So how can we think about x? If you like computers, you can think about very, very small numbers. Well, every computer has a finite precision. So you can have a number that is non-zero, but if it's really small, its square will be zero. Yes? So you could think about the ideal defined by x squared not really as the something that defines zero in terms of x, but something that defines something infinitesimally small. So it's like epsilon. That is non-zero, but its square is zero. 
In other words, what I should draw here is not a straight line, but this line has an infinitesimal thickness. Yeah? It's, it's like a number that is 0 0.0000001 in such a way that if I square it, I get zero, but the number itself is non-zero. Okay, and now I put the two generators together, which means that I should intersect these two pictures. What do I get? Well, I certainly don't get anything here and I don't get anything here because it doesn't belong to this picture. And I certainly get a line here because if I intersect a line with a thick line, I'm just getting a line. But a strange thing happens at this point. When I am in, imagine we zoom in here, I'm intersecting a cross with something that is fat. So at this point zero, I'm getting a point that is thick in this direction. You could say that a point epsilon zero belongs to the zero set, even only if I assume that epsilon square is zero. So the honest picture that would represent this ideal is a line and a thick point at zero. A point that remembers its direction. And this is exactly what primary decomposition gives us. It tells us there is a line, but additionally, something happens at the point x, y. Okay, that's a geometric intuition behind the algebraic statements that we have formally proved. Okay, now, of course, if I pass to radicals, I can see only the line. I don't see the embedded point, the point that has some thickness, and it's sort of embedded in this line. So I hope this picture is to motivate the following definition, that the radicals, they come in two flavors. Some of them, they define a variety that is visible, like a line. And some of them are embedded. They define varieties that cannot be seen in the picture. You cannot see this point because it's covered by the line. And now, having this geometric intuition, we want to make an algebraic definition. We want to divide the set of the associated primes into two pieces. One piece that is visible geometrically and one piece that is invisible but still has an algebraic meaning. Okay, so let's start with those that are visible. Let, let us the geometry guide the algebra and what does it mean in terms of radicals of those things that we can see it? So remember, the larger the ideal, the smaller the variety. And the bigger the variety, the smaller the ideal. So if we want to have a big variety that we see, what should we look at? We should look at small ideals. A minimal prime associated to I is a minimal element with respect to inclusion in the set of the associated primes. Associated
prime ideals, ideals that are not minimal, these are called minimal or isolated. Associated prime ideals that are not minimal are called embedded. Okay? So an ideal gives us a God-given set of prime ideals, the associated primes. And these naturally come in two types. Type one, minimal primes. Type two, embedded primes. Okay, so what happens here? Here we have two associated ideals. Are they minimal embedded or is one of them minimal, one of them embedded? What do you think? So what were the associated primes? You remember? We just did it. It was x and xy. Is one of them minimal? Is one of them embedded? Are both minimal? Are both embedded? What do you think? Yes? Well, x defines the line, so it's minimal, and xy is this embedded point that we... Yes. That's, that's a geometric intuition, and that's very good. That's great that you have this geometric intuition. But you can also do it just using algebra. I mean, this ideal is clearly strictly contained in here. So clearly, that one has to be minimal. Well, it's minimal in this poset. And this one is not minimal, so it's embedded. It's great that you remember this geometric picture, but if you just look at algebra, you can forget about lines and points, and you can also see a minimal and an embedded, yes? Since you have no stress on that the associated primes are somewhat not given, um, are they also so are they um, characteristic for the for the ideal, or can there be two ideals which have the same associated primes? There can be two ideals that have the same associated primes. So, for example, if you take a prime ideal, yeah, then then it has only one associated prime. It's itself. Yeah? But if you take any primary ideal, that is P primary, well then this primary ideal, the minimal primary decomposition is ju just this primary ideal, so the radical is also P. So, so, and, and clearly it's not true that every primary ideal is prime. So if you take a primary ideal that is not prime, then the two ideals, they have the same associated primes. So you really need to remember the primary ideals to reconstruct the ideal as an intersection. Okay? Okay. Now, you should maybe a little protest about this name minimal primes, because I said that they are minimal inside the set of associated primes. But it's an easy lemma that you can find the proof in the notes that in fact this is also the minimal primes is the set of minimal elements in the set of prime ideals that contain i. So a lemma, minimal primes, these are minimal elements Maybe like this minimal element. Also with respect to inclusion in the set of primes containing I. Yeah? In particular, every minimal prime with respect to inclusion that contains I is an associated prime ideal. And in particular, in a Noetherian ring, there is only a finite number of such. Okay? Any questions? And the number is just a number of irreducible components? Yes, if you look at the variety, this is the uh, number of visible, irredu yes, irreducible components of the radical. So visible, irreducible components. 
Okay. Now, we have still five minutes, and there is the last theorem that I would like to tell you. We have this proof about the existence of primary decomposition. We know that the radicals are of, of, of the ideals QI are unique. And we also note that the QIs themselves are not unique. But if we look at the example, the guiding example, we can see that what changes, what changes is not this part. So this primary ideal and this primary ideal are the same. It's this part that changes. And this is true in general. The primary ideals corresponding to minimal primes are uniquely determined. And that's the last theorem before I will pass. I will, there will be a break and then Bernd will continue with very interesting examples. We start with a, we start with a minimal primary decomposition. Okay, and we claim that the primary ideals corresponding to minimal primes are uniquely, are, do not depend on the decomposition. Yeah? So you can change the primary ideals, but only for the embedded components. Proof. So let QI0 be such that the radical of QI0 is a minimal prime. Okay, and I claim that I can reconstruct QI0 just from the radical of QI0. I claim that QI0, this is just the set of such elements of the ring that there exists an element but not in the radical of QI0 which puts A into I. So if I am able to prove the claim, the theorem is done. Because I, will, I know that the minimal primes, because all of the associated primes are unique, and so for every minimal prime, I can reconstruct the primary component. The right-hand side just depends on the radical of QI0. It doesn't depend on QI0, yes? So if I can prove this formula, I know that QI0 is well defined. Okay? So let's prove it. Well, the, to prove it, I prove both inclusions. Okay, so first we pick an element in QI0. Okay? And we want to find a B that is not in the radical of QI0, which will put it inside I which is the intersection of QIs. Okay, so how to construct such a, such a B? Well, such a B will be a product. So if we want to put something in an intersection, we want to make sure that the product belongs to every QI. Well, it will certainly be in QI0. So let's pick J distinct than I0. We pick a J distinct from I0, and we would like to define an element that will be not in the radical of QI0 that will put it inside QJ, yeah? So we want to define want BJ not in the radical of QI0 
such that bj times i will be in qj. Let's put it up. OK, so how do we find such a bj? It's not difficult, because we know that qj is not contained in the radical of qi0. Why do we know this? So if qj was contained in the radical of qi0, then also the radical of qj would be contained in the radical of qi0. But the radical of qi0 was minimal. Yes? OK. So we can find a bj inside qj minus the radical of qi0. Yes? Because this ideal is not contained here, because this one is minimal. Huh? OK, so this, we fix bj that is in qj, but not in the radical of qi0. OK? And now we define a b that is a product over j different than i0 bj. Could it be that this element is in the radical of qi0? That's a question for you. Could it be that it belongs there? Yes? Radical is a prime ideal. So a product of elements that are outside of a prime ideal cannot be there. Yes? But it clearly belongs to the intersection of QJs for j distinct than i0. Because every single j, bj belongs to qj. Yes? OK. So we have an element that is not in the radical, but clearly b times i is in the intersection of all qi's, which is i. Yeah? Which implies that a belongs to this set. So, so this proves that qi0 is included in this set. And we have one minute for the reverse inclusion, which is just a, as much time as we need. OK, so are you following? We are proving the claim. We took an element here, and we showed that it belongs here. Now we have to take an element here, and we have to show that it belongs here. Very good. OK, so now we have to take an i, and we know that there is a b not in the radical of qi0, such that ba belongs to i. Yes? And we have to prove, and we want, we want a in qi0. Yes? This will finish the proof. OK? So what do we do? Well, if b times a belongs to i, we know that b times a belongs to q i0. Yes? OK. And now notice that we are basically done, because this is a primary ideal. And if b does not belong to the radical, then, well, if, let's, let's write it, if a is not in q i0, then we have a product of elements that belong to a primary ideal, and one of them is not in the ideal, which means that b has to be in the radical of qi0. Yes? That's the definition of primary. But that's a contradiction, because we know that b is not in the radical of qi0. So what we have proved that if a is not in qi0, we are getting a contradiction. Which, which means that A has to be in QI0. And that's the end of this proof. So before we make a break, just to sum up, what we have shown today is that in a Noetherian ring, every ideal has a finite presentation as a minimal primary decomposition, so as an intersection of primary ideals. The radicals are distinct and do not depend on a primary decomposition. And further, even in a non-Netherian ring, if you have an intersection of primary 
ideals, a minimal primary ideals, then the primary ideals corresponding to minimal primes are uniquely defined. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, welcome to the second part. So I'd like to sort of talk for about 30 minutes about sort of more example-based perspective on, on primary decomposition. And I'd like to start out with this question. What do algebraic geometers do? Well, first of all, why do we ask this question? Well, linear algebra is the algebraic version of analytic geometry. So if you study lines and planes and so on, then the algebra that uh, we develop to do that is called linear algebra. So here this course is about nonlinear algebra and the associated geometry is algebraic geometry. And one thing that algebraic geometers do is they study varieties. But another thing, a more general object they study is called schemes. And so what is this? Well, there are two answers. There's answer one and then there's answer two. So Answer one is, uh, so the answer that uh, maybe Mateusz gave by way of this one example. So if you have a, a thick point, a line with a thick point. So uh, about half an hour ago, there was a line. Well, it wasn't the x-axis, it was the y-axis, but it was a line with a thick point on it, and there was the minimal prime and, and the embedded prime. So this is one answer to what a scheme is. But I'd like to give you my personal answer. So my personal answer, it's a linear system of linear partial differential equations with constant coefficients for simplicity. So a linear PDE or system of PDEs with constant coefficients is a scheme. The study of primary decomposition is about solving such systems. Now, if you think this is too easy, we can make it harder. Now, there could have been, you know, also a lecture in, in the ring for on uh, polynomial coefficients and things like this. But uh, since we only have one more lecture to go, we're going to do linear coefficients, uh, constant coefficients. If that's too easy for you, you speak to me, okay? We can make it a little harder. So I want to go over three examples. So the first example is this ideal in a polynomial ring in three variables, x, y, and z. So I picked a very nice symmetric example, x cubed minus y, z, and uh, the, the three symmetric versions. Now, in which sense is a polynomial linear PE with constant coefficients? Well, you simply take each unknown, x, and replace it with the corresponding differential operators. Whenever you see an x, you replace it by ddx. Whenever you see a y, replace it by ddy, right? Now, of course, the x's commute under multiplication. The dx and dy commutes, you know, as operators on nice functions. So you haven't really changed anything, right? So these three polynomials translate into these three partial differential equations with constant coefficients. Now here we might, you know, ask about, uh, so here are the solutions, the way we would speak about solutions here, we would say, well, there's the variety and UVW might be a point in three space that satisfies these equations. So we're looking for unknown points. Here, you know, F is an unknown function. And in my example, let's say they are complex function, holomorphic function on uh, some open subset in you know, complex three-dimensional space, for example. Okay, so, uh, okay. so if we ask for varieties, we ask for points, u, v, w on the left-hand side. If we talk about the scheme or sort of the theory of primary decomposition, I claim we're asking for the solution space. Now, to be a linear, if you have a linear differential equation, then the set of solutions is a linear space. Okay? So here, over the complex numbers, if I have a system of linear partial differential equations, if I have one solution, 
And Orlando has a different solution. We can take linear combinations and make another solution. Right? That's why it's linear. So the set of solutions is a vector space. So I'm here interested in, when I say solve this, I mean give a basis for the vector space of solutions among some function class, say holomorphic function on some open subset. Here I might list the solutions. Now, if this U is in the variety, then it's very easy to write down the corresponding solution, right? So if you have such a point, and that's equivalent to saying that uh, the exponential of Ux plus Vy plus Wz is a solution. So if u, v, and w are complex numbers, and if that triple of complex numbers satisfies these three algebraic equations, that's if and only if this exponential function solves the differential equation. Just think about it for a moment, right? You keep differentiating, so you do d, so this is our f. You take the derivative with respect to x, well, u factors out, you do it again, you get a u squared, you do it again, you get a u cubed. Then you go here, you know, d squared f, then a y factors out, and then, you know, the w factors out. So it's very easy to see that uh, a classical point, u, v, w, satisfies the polynomial solutions, uh, equations, if and only if the corresponding exponential of the linear form satisfies the differential equation. That's the easy part. That's the part I don't want to talk about, right? That's the variety part. The interesting part is here, right? The interesting part is the other part. So what are the solutions in this case? Well, I claim <clears throat> that in this example, so please interrupt me, okay? So I like to tell you the solution space. So in this case, the uh, solution space has dimension 27. Okay. It's going to be a finite dimensional complex vector space of dimension 27. Um, it's not entirely surprising, right, because if you look at this, there are three cubic equations and three unknowns, so somehow uh, people who know about Bezus theorem might think that there should be three times three times three solutions if I intersect three cubic surfaces. And that is indeed the case. So the solution space is a vector space, a complex vector space of dimension 27. And uh, I give you a basis. Well, first of all, there are, you know, these exponential solutions. So there are 17 exponential solutions like this. And uh, they come from the 17 points. Well, first of all, there's the exponential, there's the all zero solution, right? So let me maybe record this here. So the exponential of zero, which is the solution one, so the constants certainly satisfy this, right? So there's the one-dimensional space of constants, but I'd like you to think about this as the exponential of ux, zero x plus zero y plus zero z. And then, you know, there are the other non-zero solutions. So for example, you know, you have things like the exponential of x plus y plus z, that's a solution because the point one, one, one satisfies the uh, polynomial equations. Or more generally, you know, you have uh, the exponential of i to the a, x, plus i to the b, y, plus i to the c, z, where i is the uh, square root of minus one, and a, b, and c are uh, integers whose sum is congruent to zero mod four. Okay, so there are 16 solutions like this. There are 16 solutions to this congruence, you know, three numbers that are, whose sum is congruent to zero mod four. That gives you 16 solutions, such as this one. Right? And then there's this solution. Okay, so there's 16 like this. There's the constant. But then there are the others, it's the other nine, or the other ten we're really going to be interested in, okay? Now the other ten are embedded, right? They're associated to these classical exponential solutions. 
And in this example that I've chosen, they're all here. They're all you know, associated to this one. So the way you make the other solutions, you take your exponential solutions and you multiply them by a polynomial. Right? So you multiply them by a polynomial. So you, in this case, you multiply 1 by your polynomials. For example, you can multiply it by x, y, z. You can go a little more. You go x squared, y squared, z squared. That's it as far as monomials go. So, so please check. So I claim that z cubed, I'm sorry, z squared, not z cubed. Z squared, z cubed wouldn't work. But z squared is a solution, right? So, so z squared is a solution here, gets killed by both sides. Every, every, each of these derivatives, you know, kills the function z squared. So that's a solution. But z cubed is not a solution, right? The function z cubed would not satisfy the last equation. Okay? But then there are a couple more. There are, you know, there's x. So by symmetry, there's x cubed plus 6. Uh, I'm sorry, there's x cubed plus 6 yz, and then y cubed plus 6 xz, and then there's z cubed plus 6 xy, and then there's one more way up there. There's x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus z to the fourth plus 24 xyz. And that's 27. That's it, right? So if you have any solution, whatsoever to this differential equation, then I claim that your solution will be uniquely a C linear combination of these solutions. Okay. So very good. So we saw in this very simple zero dimensional case, we saw actually primary decomposition in action. Right? We saw that our ideal was not a radical ideal because they are non-exponential solutions. We have to take one of our exponential solutions and multiply it by a polynomial. So the existence of these polynomials, parts in the solution says the ideal is not a radical ideal. Now, in this example, there are 17 associated primes correspond to the 17 points, the 17 maximal ideals. Um, they're the boring part, but then one of these um, minimal primes, we have a primary ideal that is not a prime ideal, very much not a prime ideal, and this primary ideal gives rise to this cluster of 10 solutions. Of course, you know, you could sort of follow what was uh, done this morning. Um, in this case, the primary decomposition is unique. You can write down the operators. You can write down the unique primary ideals, one for each of these minimal primes. So, so for example, here the Q would be x squared y, x squared z, x y squared, x z squared, y squared z, y z squared, x cubed minus yz, y cubed minus xz, and z cubed minus xy. This is the primary ideal whose radical is xyz. And if you take this ideal and you write it in terms of operators, then this is the operators that annihilate this 10-dimensional space. You can always go back and forth between the operators and the solutions. Right? You can start with the differential equations, it has these 27 solutions, and you can take this subcluster of solutions, and you can ask, what are the linear differential equations with uh, constant coefficients that satisfy these equations? And that's it. These are the operators that annihilate those 10 solutions. Okay? Very good. So, Emra, I'm talking about something very easy. What do algebraic geometers do? They study schemes. What's a scheme? A scheme is a system of linear PDE with constant coefficients. Now, Emra thinks that's a little bit too easy. He thinks the constant coefficients should be replaced by, for example, polynomial coefficients. So, we could be in the Weyl algebra and we could talk about D modules. Is this interesting? Yes, that's very interesting. Now, Nidhi may not be impressed by D modules. But she might like synthetic biology. So we were in Basel last week, ETH Basel. You think it's in Zurich, but they have a branch in Basel. 
that does computational biology, and we got a tour by a guy whose lab does synthetic life. So he's building, you know, coding control systems into, uh, well, I don't know, into bacteria and things like that. And he is very, very, very interested in some math, and he wants to do the shift algebra. So rather than partial differential equations, he's extremely interested in partial difference equations. So, so all I'm talking about here is foundational, right? If you think this is too easy, then constant coefficients can be replaced. This can be replaced by something else. Differential equation can be replaced by difference equations, right? So if you have differential equations, then that typically is time continuous and space continuous, but you might have either time or space discrete, and then you get into difference equation. That was my example one. So that's the primary decomposition, and here the interesting action, the scheme structure takes place here in this embedded prime. Let's come to my second example. So in my second example, we actually have a non-radical ideal. So it's a particular example that I like, an example that I used to torture qualifying exam students at Berkeley with. So, so here's an example. So second example, let's take the ideal J to the XW, XZ, plus YW and YZ. So this is an ideal in a polynomial ring in four variables. And uh, well, question I would ask people, what can you tell me about this? You know, what, whatever, what, what is the property? So this looks very square free. It looks radical, but it's not radical. Right? So it's a non-radical ideal. So let's go over this one. <clears throat> So let me do the algebra first and then go over the differential equation interpretation afterwards. So the uh, associated primes in this case, there are three associated primes, the two minimal primes, xy, and then two, uh, so xy and zw, but then actually xy, zw is an associated prime. So I claim there are D is an embedded prime. So two minimal primes, one embedded prime. It's not a radical ideal. Um, I think we've seen this example at the beginning of the course. Um, <clears throat> so uh, how do you know that a, a prime is associated? Why should you believe me that this is a, these are associated primes? Well, when you don't believe somebody, you should ask them for proof, for a witness, for a certificate, right? What, what witness can I give you that these things are actually associated primes? Well, Mateusz taught you what the witness looked like. It's the A, right? Mateusz says, in order to convince you, sorry, Leon, you weren't here, but so the way you certify a uh, associated prime is you have to find some ring element, some polynomial, which Mateusz called A, such a J colon A is this thing. Then A would be the witness. Or, you know, J colon some other A is this thing. And then J colon some yet other A. So let me give you the choice. These are not unique, but uh, the witnesses. So witness A. So for example, for this one, Please check me, I just made this up quickly. So, so why Z would be an X, would be a witness for the first associated prime? Because J colon YZ, that is to say the set of all polynomials that multiply YZ into this ideal, that's the ideal generated by X and Y, right? So, so YZ, oh, uh, sorry, that's not correct. I meant WZ. So the product of the other two. Now I'm good, okay? So WZ is not in the ideal, but if you multiply WZ by X, it lands in the ideal. If you multiply WZ by Y, it lands in the ideal, and that's it. Those are all the multiples of X, the linear combinations of X and Y are the ones that multiply it in by symmetry. XY is a witness for the other minimal prime. But finally, the interesting one here, so here we could take, for example, xz minus yw. Our field does not have characteristic 2. Plus is different from minus. So xz minus yw would be a witness 
for, the, uh, for this maximal ideal being an embedded prime. Okay? Now, how do you write the primary decomposition? Well, in this case, you do not have the primary decomposition. You only have a primary decomposition because in the presence of an embedded prime, the primary component of the embedded prime is not unique. So, uh, so here J, so the primary decompositions typically look like this. So the first two, you just take the primes, but then there's an interesting one in the end, and that's non-unique. So for example, you can take uh, J plus any sufficiently high power, so the third power will do, but this three could also be four, five, six, seven, right? So this would be a primary decomposition of J. Right? So this last one is X, Y, Z, W primary. The last one has X, Y, Z, W as its radical, and this would be a primary ideal for this, and this is a valid primary decomposition. Okay? Now let's interpret this, um, maybe this example. Let's think about this example from the, uh, the PDE point of view, right? So, uh, so this Scheme structure we revealed, right? So what are we talking about? So in answer one, the answer one, we have a, we're in four-dimensional space. We have a two-dimensional coordinate plane. We have another two-dimensional coordinate plane. They meet in a thick point. And then this third embedded point is the thick point. But what does it mean for solving the differential equation? Well, let's write the differential equation. Well, first of all, let's write the radical just for good measure, so the radical, if you have a primary decomposition, so the radical is the intersection of the minimal primes, and that's of course a monomial ideal, so that's xz, xw, yz, yw is the radical of this ideal, and the radical differs from j. But let's interpret our equations again. Uh, so this is the differential equation. So we have d squared f dx dw. That's our first equation. That should be zero. Then we have d squared f dx dz plus d squared f dy dw. That's zero. And lastly, d squared f d y, d, z, so we're interested in functions, f, differentiable nice functions in x, y, z, and w that satisfy these equations. That is now a infinite dimensional vector space, right? Because now the variety is not zero dimensional, the variety is two dimensional, it's two planes in four space. So now the solution space will be an infinite dimensional solution space, but it's still controlled by the primary decomposition. So the, the first embedded prime, so what are the solutions here? So think about this as the operator ddx and ddy. Well, what are the solutions? Well, any function of the other two variables, right? So the first associated primes says that any function of, uh, what do you say, of the uh, C and W will be a solution. Right, so this class of functions, any differentiable function of Z and W will satisfy our differential equation. Then the second minimal prime says any function of X and Y will be a solution. That's easy by symmetry. But again, the interesting part is the, is the other stuff. And uh, the special solution here that comes from the embedded component is the witness. The witness, in this case, solves the differential equation, right? So the witness is x, z, uh, minus y, w. Please check it. That also satisfies the differential equation. So this primary decomposition reveals that if Sasha has any solution to this differential equation, then his solution will be a linear combination. There will be, you know, um, some function like this, plus some function like that, plus possibly a constant times that mixed function. That's sort of the mixed solution, okay? That was my second example. 
Very good. So that was my second example. Only one to go. I have only one example. Is there any question about the first two examples? Okay, example three. For example three, let's get back to semi-definite programming. Last week we spoke about semi-definite programming, so what does anything have to do, all of this has to do with optimization? Well, one source of polynomial equations are the critical equations in optimization. Right? So in optimization, you have the KKT conditions. You want to solve some optimization problem, one way to think about it is to you want to solve the critical equation subject to some other stuff, right? So for example, in semi-definite programming, we said that we have the primal semi-definite program, and we had the dual semi-definite program, and then solving them at the same time means to find a pair of feasible solutions that satisfies complementary slackness. That's all. That's semi-definite programming, right? You want to have a pair of primal feasible and dual feasible, and all you need to solve is the complementary slackness condition, and the complementary slackness condition is the equation x times y equals zero among symmetric matrices, right? So that's all you need to understand. So, so we talked about the product of two matrices being zero, so uh, Maybe my example three is how can, can the product of three square matrices be zero? So you might get this question. So let's call them A. B and C, so A, B, and C are square matrices of the same size, and since we only have a few minutes left, let me assume these are two by two matrices. Right? So how is it possible that three two by two matrices, A, B, and C, have their product, the zero matrix? What kind of triples of matrices satisfy this? Now that's a word problem that you could have been asked in your second year of undergraduate studies, right? So, or in high school, actually, I just learned in Germany, in high school, people study how to multiply matrices, right? Somebody like my cousin, ne nephew, told me this. In 11th grade, they learn how to multiply matrices. Maybe they don't know why they multiply matrices, but they learn about matrices and multiplying them. Okay. So then you can ask the question, how could you get zero, right? Now, when you, or your nephew, or your friends, See this question, how should you think about this? And there's only one answer. And the answer is your primary decomposition, right? This word problem, like any problem like this, how is it that some equations can be satisfied? That is a primary decomposition question. That is why you're here. That's why you came to this lesson today on primary decomposition, because these kind of word problems the question, how should you approach this? There's only one answer. On my personal sense, the answer is primary decomposition. That's what you're asking, right? The product of three things is zero. Well, that decode decomposes into cases. That's a primary decomposition question. Okay, so, okay, so let's make a polynomial ring. So let's say, let's do this. Oh, it doesn't matter the real number. So have R, A, I, J. Bij, Cij, so I introduce a polynomial ring in 12 unknowns, which are the entries of this matrix. I form the ideal K, so I call it K because earlier the ideals were called I and J, and J comes after K comes after J. So I look at the ideal generated by the entries of A, B, and C, right? So these are three, these are four, cubic expressions in the 12 unknowns, right? So I'm forming the ideal generated by the four trilinear expressions that you get by multiplying A, B, and C out, right? The question is, what's the primary decomposition of K? That is the question, right? If somebody wants to know how can three matrices multiply to zero, if that question comes to you, 
or your friends in 11th grade or wherever they may be. The, que the answer is, this is the question, right? This is the question is, what's the primary decomposition of K? That is the question. Okay, so let's answer it. Um, so the answer is, it turns out that this one is actually radical. So uh, that's not clear a priori, so computation. reveals that the K is radical and it's an intersection of six primes. A six prime ideals. It's an intersection of prime ideals. So radical ideal Marios means it's an intersection of the, of the minimal primes. But that's the computation reveals this, right? So the answer to the original question, there are six different ways in which a product of three matrices can be zero, right? A product of three different matrices can be zero in this way, or that way, or yet another way, or some other way. And the different ways are the associated primes, which in this case are minimal primes, of the ideal. And then, you know, what are they? Okay, so how can this be? Um, so the first three cases, um, so the first three primes are just the prime A, the prime B, and the prime C, right? If the A is the zero matrix, then that's zero, right? So if A is the zero matrix, then B and C can be anything. So in terms of the language we learned today and in this class, this is to say that the ideal generated by A11, A12, A21, and A22 is a associated prime, is in fact a minimal prime of the ideal we're studying. And then likewise B and likewise C. Right? So a product of three matrices can be zero and three of the ways are that one of the matrices are zero. Those are minimal primes. Okay. Then there are three other cases. So other possibilities are, well, it could be, <clears throat> um, okay, so here's another one. If you take the two by two minors of the matrix A11, A21, A12, A22, minus B21, minus B22, minus B11, minus B12, okay? So, uh, so this is a two by four matrix. It has six two by two minors. These are basically the minors of an unknown two by four matrix. That's a prime ideal of co-dimension three. If you wanna know one prime ideal and put it under your pillow tonight, it's the maximum minors of a rectangular matrix. The maximum minors of a rectangular matrix form a prime ideal, and that's it, right? So what does this say? This means the A matrix has rank one, and the B matrix has rank one, and they multiply to zero. That's the second way. Right? So the second way this could happen is if A times B is the zero matrix already, and that happens because they have rank one and the row space of one is the kernel of the other, right? Now by, then by symmetry, it could also happen on the other end, right? So you have I2 could be B11, B21, B12, B22 minus C21, minus C22, C11, C12, right? So that says that uh, the product of B and C, the, the terminal product, is the zero matrix. That certainly makes it zero. And, you know, they have rank one and one in the row space of one is the kernel of the other, right? So that's the second possibility. And then the last one, the last prime, um, is the following. So it's K plus... Um, I hope I said this right. The last associated prime, I think, is a typo. I think it's actually should be the determinant of C. Sorry, so the last determinant of B. So uh, it could happen, right? It could happen. Another way this could happen is if A has rank one and C has rank one, 
But then the middle guy sort of, you know, takes the kernel of one matrix to the image of the other. Right? That could also happen. Right? And that's described by this idea. Right? So this, is all, this happens to be a prime idea. Okay. So uh, there's three boys. Yes, question? Uh, so uh, since we know that K is radical, we also, I mean, we should also know that all the associated primes are minimal. That's correct. Okay. Uh, that's after the fact. So after the calculation, you can see that these six are prime ideals, and they are therefore minimal primes of the ideal K. Okay, now, so in English, right? Now we go back, and we forget about primary decomposition. Now we go back and say, well, you talked about matrices. Maybe you know what the rank is, right? So how can the product be zero? Well, the product can be zero. Either A drops in as rank zero, or this has rank zero, or that has rank zero, or a consecutive pair, both have rank one and multiply to zero. And the third possibility, the most interesting possibility, is that sort of you know, A and C have rank one, but the middle guy you know, makes them uh, multiply to zero, okay? Now you might say, okay. If you had given me 10 minutes, I would have figured that out, right? I didn't need primary decomposition. Sure, that's true. You could have figured that out without primary decomposition. But primary decomposition is the systematic first thing that you must think of if somebody asks you a question like this. And truth be told, semi-definite programming is not about two by two matrices, right? There are bigger matrices, and for bigger matrices, you do need a computer. Thanks for your attention.